This episode is brought to you by Experian. Are you paying for subscriptions you don't use, but can't find the time or energy to cancel them? Experian could cancel unwanted subscriptions for you, saving you an average of $270 per year and plenty of time. Download the Experian app. Results will vary. Not all subscriptions are eligible. Savings are not guaranteed. Paid membership with connected payment account required. Today on an all-new Dr. Phil. Married eight months, and he's saying, beam me up. Honeymoon hangovers. And I'm not talking about the kind you get from alcohol. (laughs) She can't stop clinging to her husband. I'm just lucky to go to work every day. She'll stop at nothing to get his attention. He has a curfew. 6 or 6.30, I have to be home. And then to go to bed at 10.30. You gotta go to bed when she's tired. Yes, yes, exactly. At least he has to stay up to a reasonable hour. This is gonna be a changing day in your life. 10 seconds to air. I know things are tough out there, but we can do this. Here we go. I want you to get excited about your life. Four, and ready, three. See. Let's do it. All right, today we are talking about the honeymoon hangover. Now let me tell you, nobody's immune from this. Maybe you're a newlywed or maybe your kids are newlyweds, but nobody's immune. It happens after the vacation in the Bahamas is over. The wedding is over. The caterer goes home. The dress is put away. You know what I'm talking about, when the bride and groom realize there's something besides the wedding, it's called marriage. It is shocking how little couples know about each other before they walk down the aisle. It stuns me. We took our cameras out and asked couples what they wanted to know before they tie the knot. Take a look. Hi, Dr. Phil, I'm Jake. And I'm Erin, and I have a question. How much of my fiance's past should I know before we get married? When Tim and I get married, should we get a joint banking account? So not getting along with my fiance's parents prevent us from getting married? Do you think it's okay that we live together before we're married? Well, those are all very important questions and I'm gonna answer them during this show. But first, I have a question from a couple that are not, well, I don't think they would qualify for newlyweds. Jim and Jan have been married 55 years. Jan says she's still dealing with an issue that should have been resolved, well, 55 years ago. I'm Jan. And I'm Jim. And we've been married 55 years. That all? (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Phil, my husband's been very good about putting the lid on the toilet seat down, but now when the trash needs to be taken out, he doesn't do it unless I ask. Is there anything I can do to just get him to take it out on his own? (laughs) No. (laughs) Absolutely not. Jim and Jan are here, and Jan says she's tired of reminding her husband to take out the trash. So give yourself up, Jim. What's the issue here? <laughs> well, she, she said she notices that the trash can's overflowing. Why don't I take it out? And I thought, if you know it's, to take, it's overflowing, take it out. <laughs> and you don't because? Because that's supposed to be the man's job to take the trash out. <laughs> well, all right, but look, here's, here's the deal. There's actually been research on this. Women look at things like that as being acts of love because it lightens your load, right? If he loved me, he would want to do these things for me. Exactly. Men look at it as, eh, you know, you emptied, it's going to fill back up. What difference does it make? <laughs> you <know>? You're right. <laughs> you just see it differently. But I tell you what, if that's the biggest problem you got after 55 years, we all want your deal. Yeah. I'll tell you for sure. Isn't that great? Jeremy and Tamara have only been married eight months and they're already having big problems. Just eight months. Problems over one little word. Clingy. Take a look. Tamara's not the person I married. If he's the one that's changed. Tamara is very clingy. I am not clingy. Since we've gotten married, it's control, control, control. I feel like a three-year-old and she's my mom. What would you do differently? I would have friends. If you wanted to have friends and you wanted to go out and have fun, then why'd you get married? 
I'm not allowed to do anything. I'm not allowed to take judo, work out, have horses. I didn't want to be home by myself. My curfew is at 6 o'clock. It's not a curfew. I'm not allowed to go work out by myself after work, am I? But I just prefer you not to. We have to go to bed at the exact same time every night. I tried college. You made me quit that. Because it means time away from me. She complains and gripes all the time, and I'm sick of it. I don't feel like I'm griping. I feel like I'm just telling him my needs. I didn't think any woman could be that extreme to want you there constantly. I almost feel like it's kind of psychotic. I don't think I'm needy at all. I think that I need a normal amount of attention for a woman. Okay, you don't think you're clingy at all? No, I don't think I'm clingy at all. I think it's just normal. Because he kind of thinks you are. I know. <laughs> Extremely clingy. Are you surprised to hear that? No, I'm not surprised because he's told me before, but I don't think that's accurate. Okay, what are you after? What, what, whatever you call it, whether you call it clingy or lovey or just normal, what, what is it you're after? Um, I don't think I'm really after anything. Oh, sure you are. <laughs> no, I mean, of course you are. You, you want something. Mm -hmm. I mean, this behavior is in pursuit of something. His attention. His like attention. His attention, yeah. Okay, so what you want is his attention. Yes, I want his attention. Okay, and you're getting it in a negative way. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, okay so what you want is attention, mm -hmm. and you're not getting it. Yeah. Are you a bottomless pit? No, I don't think I'm a bottomless pit. I think I just want a normal amount Is of there attention. enough attention? Yes, there is enough attention. And once I get full up, then I'm fine with him going off and doing his own things. It's just that he's always gone and always going to do other things. So. Okay, so what we've determined so far is two things. One, you're after attention, and two, this is all about you. <laughs> no. <laughs> Very well put. <laughs> no, really, because you said once I'm full, he can go do whatever he wants to. But until I'm full, he's to maintain the vigil and stay there with me. Yes, but it's not about me. It's about the marriage, like working on the marriage. I don't think so. He's gone all the time. I don't think so, because you didn't say once the two of us are full and feel loved, then we are free to go do what we want. You said once I'm full, then he can go do whatever he wants after my needs are met. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just asking if I run a red light, stop me. No, okay. Yeah, that's probably true. Here's what he said. This is what he says represents your clinginess. Tell me if I get this right. Uh, that Jeremy has to come straight home from work yes. every night. He has a curfew. He doesn't have a curfew. It's just after work, I'd like him to come what home. What time is dinner. your curfew? From work, it's 6 or 6.30. I have to be home. Um, and then to go to bed at night, normally 10.30s. Okay, so 6.30 home, 10.30 in bed, because you got to go to bed when she's tired. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right, did I get that right? At least he has to stay up to a reasonable hour. He likes to go to bed at 8.30 or 9. That's not that's true. That's not true at all. I, I have to be at work at 7 o'clock in the mornings. So, you know, if I had a long week, there are nights that I would like to go to bed at 8 o'clock just to get a few extra hours to sleep. Well, you married a wild and crazy guy. <laughs> yeah. 8 o'clock, he's going to bed. Well, I bet you all stay up later than that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> See, all right. You wanted him to quit his job because it was mandatory overtime and that took away from you. Yes. He can no longer hang out with his friends. He could hang out with his friends if he hadn't, but he's never even asked to hang out with his friends. So. Um, I'm just reading what he, these are quotes. Yeah, I'm just lucky to go to work every day, so I, I don't really need friends, I guess. <laughs> okay. He's not allowed to work out or lift weights. He had to give up judo. Both, all of this because he took time away from you. Has to go to bed same time you do. He had to choose college or work part time, not both, because it took too much time. He's not allowed to have horses because it took too much time. He can't have hobbies that you can't do with him. Yeah, but he also is an overworker. So he's gone a lot of times working, too. Because so, he works a full job, like, all day from 7 to 7 sometimes. And then yeah. the weekends as well. Okay, look, look over your list there. Yeah. You see this list here? Mm -hmm. That's the second half. <laughs> There's a first half. <laughs> you don't think any of that qualifies as clinging? Okay, yes, some of it probably is clinky. Which parts? Mm. How about he has to come straight home from work and has a curfew of 6.30? I don't see it as a curfew, though. I see it as, like, we have dinner together. What so. happens if he rolls in at 8? <laughs> <laughs> she lays down the whip, I'll tell you. <laughs> what happens if you roll in at 8? Oh, uh, we're going to argue for at least two hours. Well, at least you're together. Yeah, yeah, we are together. <laughs> 
I mean, really, you're wanting attention. And do you, do you get that you're getting attention, but it's not positive? Yeah, yeah, I know that. Because he used a word to describe you. He's used two words to describe you that really kind of jumped out at me. One was clingy, and the other was psycho. <laughs> you don't mean that literally. Not you literally. You psychotic if they were sitting yeah, my, in the Obviously, office. I'd be gone probably at that point. But, but you no, mean she's just over, just, uh, just over these issues, yes, I do believe. It's so what do, you, what do you think about that? For me, I just feel like he's working all the time, so I just need some attention because I feel like he wants to work all the time plus do all these things. So when are we going to be together? I'm really looking at your words here because I'm trying to help you. Yeah. yeah. You don't seem like you need some attention. He needs to come straight home from work, had to quit a job with mandatory overtime, cannot hang out with friends, cannot have hobbies, cannot lift weights, has to go to bed when you go to bed, cannot go to college uh, because all of this needs to be devoted to you. Yeah. Okay, how's that working for you? <laughs> Not very well. <laughs> You're on the Dr. Phil show. You've been married eight months, and he's saying, beam me up, Scotty. Yeah. All right. Well, so how well do these newlyweds really know each other? Did they just kind of walk blind down the aisle? Well, I put their knowledge to the test. We're going to find out if either of them passed my newlywed quiz when we come back. We fought on our honeymoon because I wanted to get up and do things, and Tamara just wanted to stay in the room. I figured it was a honeymoon, so we should spend most of our time in the room. On the second day of the honeymoon, I prayed to God, asking him to forgive me if I had made a mistake. Plus, Dr. Phil, should not getting along with my fiance's parents prevent us from getting married? Well, we're talking about what happens when the wedding is over and the only thing you've returned from your honeymoon with is a hangover. And I'm not talking about the kind you get from alcohol. I'm talking about the one you get when you realize that you and your spouse are together now for the rest of your life. <laughs> and their habits and their qualities that you didn't sign up for are hitting you right between the eyes. Now, throughout today's show, I'm answering questions from engaged couples who want to know how to avoid this hangover. Now, one of the questions is this. I get it all the time. If you're going to marry someone, do you need to get along with their family? Uh, that would be good. It would be good if you get along with their family. But here's the thing. You may have some psycho mother-in-law or psycho father-in-law that you just can't get along with. Then you and your potential spouse need to sit down and have a very definite strategy for how you're going to handle that. Because there's no room for divided loyalty. So if you got problems with them, you got to work it out about how you're going to handle it, where the boundaries and the fence lines are going to be. Now, Jeremy and Tamara have been married less than a year, and they're now realizing the only thing they have in common is they just don't have anything in common. Since we've been married, Jeremy and I realized that we have nothing in common. He's a country boy. I'm a city girl. I like hiking, being outdoors, fishing. Tamara has no hobbies. She likes sitting at home watching TV. I like to relax. I never met anybody that needed so much downtime in my life. I feel I've made a lot of sacrifices. I sold my horses because I knew it was something she didn't like. Horses are not a hobby. They are a lifestyle. I would rather him spend his time with me. We fought on her honeymoon because I wanted to get up and do things, and Tamara just wanted to stay in the room. I figured it was a honeymoon, so we should spend most of our time in the room. On the second day of the honeymoon, I was already feeling lonely. I felt like he wasn't into me. I prayed to God, asking him to forgive me if I had made a mistake. I was thinking the same thing, that maybe we both might have made a mistake. You say you feel like you're in jail. Yes. It's constantly having to be home and not getting to do anything you want. Um, I thought when we got married, you know, we'd settle into our lives a little bit more, and um, she would do certain things by herself, and I would get to do things as well. But that didn't work out so well. But he, I feel like he does do a lot of stuff by himself because he's constantly working. Like, it's not just a normal job. He works about, like, 60 hours a week and on weekends part-time. So I feel like he's always gone. Would you say that it would be accurate and honest to say that you kind of wait for him to get home to entertain you and interact with you and sometimes yeah yeah i do count on him for that so you kind of count in the minutes till he gets home yeah sometimes <laughs> you think that puts a little pressure on him <laughs> yeah probably do you do you have friends yeah i have friends well yeah i do <laughs> <laughs> my mom is my best friend and i also have another best friend but i don't have like a whole group of friends yeah 
So you don't have a lot of distractions other than him. Yeah. And he has a lot of other distractions, and you're, you're carving those away systematically so he'll have less competition for time with you. Yeah. But he doesn't want to be with you now, right? Yeah. Because you said he gives you like one-word answers, and he's real curt and uninvolved yeah. and disengaged. Yeah, he gets really angry. Yeah, because he's resenting you mm -hmm. for taking everything out of his life that he loved except you. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair statement? Oh, that's very fair. That's very fair. I'm, it's just everything being taken away. I really do love her, and you know, but it's hard at times when you see so much taken away, and you just feel they don't appreciate what you've done. Yeah, so you got a chip on your shoulder. Definitely. Because when y'all were dating, you talked all the time, right? Yeah, we were together 24-7, basically. Yeah, and he would call and mm -hmm. talk to you late at night yeah. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you just knew each other so much that <laughs> you could just finish each other's sentences, right? Yeah. <laughs> And that's like really cute when you're dating, but then when you're married, it's, hey, stop interrupting me. <laughs> it kind of shifts, right? It does. It so does. it used to be like so cute. He knows yeah. me so well, but not so much. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So what's going to happen if this continues? Just be honest. We both agree we can't live our lives this way. She needs more for me, and I need more to myself as well. All right. This is honesty check. And you need to be honest when I, when I ask you this question. If you could turn the clock back and you knew then what you know now, would you have married her? That's a very hard question. There's so much I do love about her, but I wish we had worked on ourselves more before we got married and really paid attention to all the details. You know, you think it's all cute when they want to be with you all the time, but in the long run, you're like, oh, that's too much. I got to breathe sometime. It's an interesting answer. Now answer my question. <laughs> if you knew it was going to be like this, would you have married her? At times, no. At times, no. What do you think about that? I mean, it hurts. It does. Because I want him to love me and, you know, feel like he wants to be with me. But I do understand that we do have problems. And so, I mean, at times, I wish that... He was with me more too. Well, you can't change what you don't acknowledge. And my question to you is, are you too clingy? When you got here, you said, I don't think I'm clingy at all. We then went over some reality. And so I'm asking you again now, does it mean that you don't have the right to stake out your territory, that you don't have the right for companionship, that, you shouldn't, that he shouldn't want to be with you and share with you and, and, and resonate with you at every level, mentally, emotionally, physically, socially, spiritually, every possible way, but are you being too clingy? Yes, there's a possibility I'm being too clingy. There's a possibility? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Well, there's a possibility that I'm going to have more to say about that. <laughs> Another problem these newlyweds say they're having is their sex life. As much as they're apparently together, they don't spend much time in that activity, like none. Be right back. There's been several times I've tried to give Jeremy a hug and he'll push me away. It's hard to be passionate with somebody you're fighting with. I don't think either of us will want to continue to live like this. Plus. Dr. Phil, I have a question. How much of my fiance's past should I know before we get married? Well, we're talking to couples who are going through a honeymoon hangover. Now, another question that I'm commonly asked is how much do you need to know about your fiance's past before you get married? <sighs> That's a tough one, actually. I, I think you need to know a lot about your fiance's past, but not necessarily in detail. But you do need to know a lot about them, be able to answer questions about their values, their beliefs, their expectations, their goals, and what their history has been, but not without gory detail sometimes. Now, Tamara and Jeremy were engaged for only four months and married four months after that. So they only knew each other for a total of eight months before they got married. And now, eight months later, they haven't hit the two-year mark yet. They don't even have a sex life. Jeremy says it's hard to want to have sex with someone who is constantly complaining. Our sex life has been an issue since the beginning of our marriage. It's hard to be passionate with somebody you're fighting with. My marriage is in the red zone. Jeremy is very cold, distant, hateful. I feel trapped. Most nights, Jeremy will come home and barely even speak to me. It's blatantly obvious to me that he has zero interest. There's been several times I've tried to give Jeremy a hug or sit in his lap, and he'll push me away. I am afraid that Jeremy may not love me anymore. I feel she's being a drama queen. 
I feel that maybe Jeremy was putting on an act before we were married, and now I'm getting to see who he truly is. I don't think either of us want to continue to live like this. So what do you predict? Is it too late? Has she shown you a side of her that has you alienated to the point that she's just no longer attractive to you? No, I don't believe it's too late. I just think if she got some of the issues worked out that we have problems with, um, it would help me out a lot more. I just need a little space, and I mean, I still have feelings for her. I think she's beautiful. It's just I need some space is all. What are you doing to make this marriage better? Uh, listening to all the rules. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's rephrase that. <laughs> what are you doing to make this marriage better? I'm going to counseling. Anything that I can do to change to help us. Uh, as far as the day-for-day -day thing, um, not necessarily anything. I kind of gave up at some point. So you basically checked out? Yes, I did. Hi. Okay, and that's going to fix things how? It's not going to fix anything right now. I just hope that... In the long run, I guess we start dealing with our problems a little bit better uh, through counseling and stuff. Well, but you're here. Let's start dealing with them now. Yes. Because I've been talking to, listen, I, do, I think you're being over demanding. I think you're being whiny and clingy, and I think you are driving him out the door. I don't think you could do it any faster with a cattle prod. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I'm serious. I think he's just a... I think he's a pretty down-to-earth, good old boy that's kind of live and let live and, you know, let's be happy and each have our lives and kind of go along. And I think you're whining and demanding and criticizing and requiring. And then you say, well, he won't sleep with me. Well, you have a parent-child relationship here. You are treating him like a child. You get home at 6.30, you go to bed when I tell you to, you don't hang out with your friends, you're not going to take that stupid judo, get rid of those horses. Um... <laughs> That's a parent-child relationship. And, you know, aside from Oedipus, most guys don't want to sleep with their mothers. And so when you have a parent-child relationship, then everybody backs away. Now, you, on the other hand, are being the perfect rebellious son. Okay, you don't tell me what I want to hear. I'll just pout. I'll give you one-word answers, stare at the wall, and be passive-aggressive. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. God, I hate her. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. I mean, have I, have I got it right? Yeah. Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> okay. I, I wouldn't say that out loud, though, but... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's my job. Okay. <laughs> and trust me, don't try it at home. Oh. <laughs> okay? I have security all over here. Take her, out at, take her out at the knees if she makes a fast move. But, I mean, so I'll ask you what I ask her. How is that working for you? It's not working at all. I mean, come uh, on, you married her. Work. Yeah. You married her. Sweep her off her feet. Yeah, I, um, I get to a point where I'm like, uh, I don't want to deal with it. And I know it makes it... But that's immature. Uh, yeah. you, you're married. You're married. You made the decision. You married her. And, and your job is to help her be happy. It's not your job to make her happy. She has to decide that. Mm -hmm. And you've got to understand, even if you think you are totally right in all this, it is ridiculous. He works too many hours. He has too many hobbies. He's stupid friends. Even if you think you're totally right, it's not working. Yeah. Because I... I can tell you, he, he isn't going to go for this. Yeah. He's eventually going to buck enough that he says, that's it. I, I don't want this. I'd rather be healthy alone than sick with her. But how do we find a compromise? Like, how do we find it to where he spends time with me, but he has everything else too? Well, I'm so glad they asked that. <laughs> because right after we take this break, I'm going to give them the ABCs of how they work that out. Hi, Dr. Phil. We have a question for you. Do you think it's okay that we live together before we're married? We're talking to newlyweds who say their spouse changed after the wedding. Not sure they really changed so much as they didn't really know what their spouse was like before the wedding. Now, another question engaged couples want to know is, should you live together before marriage? Well, let me answer it this way. You need to know each other really, really well. Marriage is not a date. 
that, uh, let me tell you, when you go on a date, they show up, their hair's done, he's shaved, he's got on a clean shirt, she's got on a pretty dress, and they got a big smile on their face, and let's go party. When they get home, they got a flannel nightgown. <laughs> he's got some old sweatpants from junior high football. <laughs> You shouldn't marry somebody till you have seen them with the flu. <laughs> if you haven't cleaned up their vomit, you shouldn't walk the aisle. So should you live together? What you need to do is really, really know each other. I mean, really know each other. Now, I'm talking to newlyweds Jeremy and Tamara who are struggling because, in my opinion, they didn't really know each other before they tied the knot. Now, we decided to put Jeremy and Tamara to the test. Could they answer basic questions about the other. Take a look. 10. Five. Garland, Texas. I want to say we're all in. A horseshoe or a farrier. Traveling. At McDonald's. First one is she worked in a yeah, manufacturing plant. Aiken. That I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you ever had one or not. Little sister. <laughs> Clingy. Workaholic. Okay. So what do you think? <laughs> Thought we knew each other a lot better than that. <laughs> you really don't know, do you? No. You can't name his three best friends. No, I, no, I guess I didn't. <laughs> And then you're the one that said this isn't all about you. You don't even know his three best friends. And you're, you're not much better. You're probably thinking, oh, this is going pretty good. <laughs> I got a You don't even know where she was born. And we were born at the same hospital. That's bad. <laughs> They're like 10 minutes apart. Rolette, Garland, it's the same thing. <laughs> you didn't know where she was born? No. No, I didn't. <laughs> you didn't know her nickname. You didn't know how many children she wants. Yeah, I just knew it was a lot, and that's kind of went in one ear and out the other. I mean, I, I was just thinking about sex at the time. Gee, so. I... I... <laughs> well, you apparently wore that out. <laughs> you know, I look at this and don't ask myself why y'all are in trouble. I ask myself why not. I also had Jeremy and Tamara each take the partner awareness test from my book, Relationship Rescue. Now, out of 20 questions, Jeremy got 12 right and eight wrong. Tamara got 10 right and 10 wrong. Let's take a look at a few of the answers that they didn't know. Okay, let's start with Jeremy. Now, Jeremy's wrong results were this. I can describe what my partner considers to be her greatest area of difficulty in interacting with her parents. You would wanna know that, right? You wanna know how somebody gets along with their parents and if there's a tr trouble area, where would it be? He didn't know. I can describe the most traumatic event that occurred in my partner's childhood. He didn't know. I know what makes my partner laugh. No clue. <laughs> I can quote three things my partner says to me that she says to no one else in the world. Not a clue. Tamara, I can name my partner's three best friends. No. I know what accomplishments my partner's most proud of. No. I know what my partner considers to be his greatest losses in life. No, you, you got some things right, but you got an awful lot wrong. So maybe your compatibility was just way low. So I don't know if you made the right decision to get married or not, but I know this. Sometimes you make the right decision. Sometimes you just have to get busy and make the decision right. You know, there's a, there's a real basic formula for success in a relationship, and it's this. The quality of a relationship is a function of, one, how well it meets the needs of the two people involved. Are your needs getting met? No. Are your needs getting met? So got both of you, neither of your needs are getting met. And the other is it has to be based on a really solid underlying friendship. Friendship, what do you do with friends? You laugh, you tell jokes, you, 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 you cut up, you confide in one another, you help one another achieve things. That's what friends do, right? How good of friends are y'all? Probably not that great. Not that good. <laughs> so here we have it. There's two things that, 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 that define the quality of a relationship. One's a friendship. You don't have one. And the other is how well it meets your needs and they're not being met. 
You need to wake up every morning and say, what can I do today to make my wife's life better? Don't wait for her to do it. Don't worry about her being a bottom split. You need to wake up every day and say, what can I do today where she's just going to go, oh, that's nice. I let her sleep in in the morning, so I thought that was enough. <laughs> that's a start. That covered Monday. You haven't seen her in the mornings. <laughs> you, you need to wake up every morning and ask yourself, what can I do to make his life better? It's about being selfless, not selfish. It's not about asking, what can I get? It's about what can I give? And all of a sudden, you got two people moving towards one another to try to make the other person happy. You've got to become selfless for a period of time. And if you do it at the same time, then you've got two selfless people saying, here we go. Let's come together. Well, that's one thing we agree on is we're both selfish, so <laughs> that's a big problem. So that's... you do have something in common. Yeah, we do. We do. We agreed on that. So let's create something else in common, being selfless. And I'm going to give you some very specific exercises to do to get you through that, okay? I mean, very structured, specific. 30 minutes a day you can do these. And it will make an amazing difference in what you know about each other and how well you connect. And by the way, I'll put all of those on drphil.com. It's a 14-day program for your marriage. It takes 30 minutes a day. It'll be on drphil.com at the end of this show. Keep listening to what I have to say as we move forward. All right, next, a wife who says her husband pulled a 180-degree turn after they got married and changed his mind about two very important things. What were they? We're going to find out when we come back. Plus. Dr. Phil, when we get married, should we get a joint banking account? Closed captioning provided by... Across this great country, from coast to coast, you've told me about the crossroads we're facing. That's exactly why I wrote, We've Got Issues, How You Can Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. This book isn't just a conversation starter. It's a roadmap for standing strong in the face of adversity, for embracing our core values when they're needed most. We're talking about real strategies for real people dealing with real issues from navigating the complexities of today's polarized world to fortifying our families. And I set forth in the book 10 principles that I think are critical for a healthy society. This is not about politics. I'm not a politician, don't want to be a politician, don't know enough about politics to talk about it. But I talk about every angle of life as we know it, from family and relationships to the burning issues that are shaping our world today. We've got issues. How you can stand strong for America's soul and sanity and you'll find it anywhere books are sold. It's about time we start addressing what truly matters. Hi, I'm Chris Gethard, and I'm very excited to tell you about Beautiful Anonymous, a podcast where I talk to random people on the phone. I tweet out a phone number, thousands of people try to call, I talk to one of them, they stay anonymous, I can't hang up, that's all the rules. I never know what's going to happen. We get serious ones. I've talked with meth dealers on their way to prison. I've talked to people who survived mass shootings. Crazy funny ones. I talked to a guy with a goose laugh, somebody who dresses up as a pirate on the weekends. I never know what's going to happen. It's a great show. Subscribe today. Beautiful Anonymous. You're a podcast listener, and this is a podcast ad. Reach great listeners like yourself with podcast advertising from Lips and Ads. Choose from hundreds of top podcasts offering host endorsements, or run a reproduced ad like this one across thousands of shows to reach your target audience with Lips and Ads. Go to lipsandads.com now. That's L I B S Y N ads.com. If you would like to purchase a tape or transcripts of your favorite Dr. Phil show, please log on to drphil.com or call 866 4 Dr. Phil. That's 866 437 7445. 866 437 7445. We've been talking today to newlyweds who say their spouse has changed after the marriage. Some people call that bait and switch. I'll show you one thing and then give you another. Another important question that I'm often asked by engaged couples is after you get married, should you have a joint checking account? The truth is I've asked a lot of CPAs about this. I've asked a lot of money managers about it. And it depends on your relationship, what works for you. Personally, I think two people 
in the same checking account where one doesn't necessarily know what the other is doing can be a problem. But it takes communication if you're going to have a joint checking account, and you have more independence if you don't, but it doesn't mean you don't have accountability to the family financial plan. Now, Nick and Mandy tied the knot three years ago, and Mandy says within the first year of marriage, Nick drastically changed. She says before they got married, they were both Christians. Now she says Nick has turned into an angry atheist and a vegetarian. Now, do those go together in some way? <laughs> no, they're not related. Those don't necessarily go together. No. All right. Um, did you say one thing before you got married and changed to something else? Uh, I don't think that I necessarily like led Mandy astray. But did you tell her one thing and then change to another? Because you say he did. Yeah, I think he did because he was going to church with me. I knew that he was searching for a lot of answers. I didn't know that it was going to lead to that result. Now listen, I'm not saying that, that hey, you're not entitled to your thoughts, feelings, and beliefs about this because that's a very individual thing. Yeah. And you're being honest about it now. And I, t I, I totally get that. Totally get that. The question is... If you said one thing before and did something different, then you've been betrayed or misled. Right. And if you didn't, and, and frankly, you said that he misled you, but you also said we never really had a long, serious conversation about this. We talked about our own individual religious beliefs. We didn't really talk about how that would necessarily mesh together. But if you are a, a person of faith, and you, and you clearly are, then don't you believe that you have to be accepting of other people's points of view and not judgmental? I try really hard not to judge him, but we get, every discussion that we have had about it ends up coming to a point where he asked me why I believe a certain thing, and I, I get to a point where it's just because I have faith. Like, it's, right. I've been born and raised that way, and he doesn't have... And you take a more scientific approach. Yeah, well, I'm... I need evidence um, more, more times than not. I'd, I, I have trouble having faith. Let's put it that okay, way. Okay, I got you. So here's the question. Should Nick have to bite his tongue about his beliefs around their children when they get older? Well, Mandy thinks so. And she says this is a big deal because she believes totally that the life hereafter is so important in her future and in the children's future and in her husband's future. And she's very concerned about where this is going to lead if he remains of, of this particular belief. Big deal. We'll talk about it when we come back. Bye. <laughs> DrPhil.com, brought to you in part by... We're going to have to say goodbye to Tom. But hey, five bucks... You should go to CC's. Got five bucks and change? You gotta go to CC's. Travel consideration provided by... If your nails can't grow past the breaking point, give them Nutrinail Growth Formula to help brittle nails grow past the breaking point. For beautiful nails, get Nutrinail Growth Formula. We do our shows in front of a live audience and we have a great time here, don't we, everybody? So if you want to be in the Dr. Phil audience, go to drphil.com and click on be in the audience or call 323-461-PHIL, 323-461-7445. We'll see you right here. We're talking about what to do when your spouse changes his or her mind after you get married about something you thought you were on the same page about. Now, Mandy says her husband, Nick, changed dramatically within the first year of their marriage. When Mandy and Nick met, they were both Christians, but now Mandy says her husband is an atheist. Now, Nick doesn't feel he should have to hide his beliefs from their two children, but Mandy is worried that Nick will tell them and influence how they think, feel, and believe, right? Absolutely. That's my number one fear is, is I'm, I'm secure in my eternity, but I'm, you know, they're only two and three. They're still very early in life, and I, I'm very concerned about their eternity. If they grow up doubting God, I don't know where they're going to end up. Okay. Let, let me see if, if I get this right. You're not closed about this at all. In fact, you're very active in your search for answers and 
so you're not closed about it. You're open. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I do a lot of research. Uh-huh. Um, religion is actually a, a subject that I'm very interested in. And I keep, I keep trying to discover new things, and I keep trying to figure things out. And it's not like I've completely closed my eyes to Christianity or, or to God at all. I'm, I'm just I'm looking for that evidence, I guess. Yeah. I don't know what evidence he's going to find to, you know, that he can hold in his hand. Well, it may not be that kind of evidence. You don't know. What you have to do is be willing to love him and accept him and not close your heart to him because he doesn't believe the way you do at this point. You can pray every day out loud <laughs> that he will see the light, that he will come to know on a faith-based experience what you know on a faith-based experience. And you don't know when that could happen for the end of the day. It could never happen. Right. But what you have to do is, is, is not shut down and be judgmental about this, particularly when he's open about it. He, he actually reads books and researches this. Right. Well, he read, most of the books he reads affirm his beliefs where he is now. doesn't matter. The point is he's open to new data, to bringing in new data and new experiences, right? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I do read a lot of um, the atheistic literature, but I also read the Bible. And you know, I try to understand what I'm trying to get my head around. Yeah. Would you try to guide your children away from a faith-based religious mindset if, when they get to the point to make those choices for themselves? Um, I wouldn't necessarily guide them away because I understand that they were brought up in that. And that's not like I want to say... Hey, Children, I, you know, you've been brought up in this, and now I want to say, you know, forget everything you've learned. Um, I definitely want to cherish those things that we do have in common, those, those, I guess, moral beliefs and, and being a good person, and just say there are other ideas out there. You have to be willing to keep an open mind about this. And the woman you love and the children that you are nurturing together, uh, you want to continue to be accepting about this, not judge him about it, don't cut him off, don't be angry with him, don't criticize his position, because uh, that's not the Christian way. Right. The Christian way is to be accepting and to be patient and just pray that the time will come when God would move his heart and move your family in that way. And you say you're a woman of faith, have faith. I'm trying. Faith. <laughs> he's very open about it, yeah. so he's not closed. He'll take in new data. Any time, and you never know when something will happen to move his heart. Be right back. Don't let your antenna TV become just a box. Upgrade it with this digital converter by February 2009, or it will not work. Call this number or visit this website. Don't let your TV become just a box. For more information on relationships, how to improve the one you're in, or rescue yours from the brink, log on to drphil.com. Well, I want to thank my newlywed couples today, uh, as well as the engaged couples who asked very important questions. And of course, Jim and Jan, 55 years and still going strong. On drphil.com, I'm going to have a list of the questions you and your potential mate need to cover before you get married. It's kind of a premarital boot camp of things you need to talk about and discuss. Because if it's a problem now, it'll be a bigger problem when you get married. So find that common ground now. We have a great time here in the studio audience. Do we not? We have fun here? So... If you're going to be in the Los Angeles area, we would love to have you. The tickets are free, actually, which is a heck of a deal. Uh, go to drphil.com, click on Be in the Audience, or call 323-461-PHIL. That's so goofy. <laughs> <laughs> or 323-461-7445. Thanks for being here. So long.
Well, I want to thank my newlywed couples today, uh, as well as the engaged couples who asked very important questions. And of course, Jim and Jan, 55 years and still going strong. Uh, <laughs> On DrPhil.com, I'm going to have a list of the questions you and your potential mate need to cover before you get married. It's kind of a premarital boot camp of things you need to talk about and discuss. Because if it's a problem now, it'll be a bigger problem when you get married. So find that common ground now. We have a great time here in the studio audience. Do we not? We have fun here? So... If you're going to be in the Los Angeles area, we would love to have you. The tickets are free, actually, which is a heck of a deal. Uh, go to drphil.com, click on Be 